Hello everyone and welcome back to Imperator Rome. I'm Lord Forent here with a guide on the Maura Empire. So um, the Maura do not actually start as an empire, they just start as a major power, but they are the largest and strongest nation at the beginning of the game. Um, the only one that gets close is the Seleucids, and you get an event almost immediately that the AI almost always takes, which gives you this land here and makes you even larger. So the Maura are led by Chanda Gupta Maura. Um, he's really good. He's a very, very talented ruler, historically very successful in his conquests. Um, surprisingly, he does not have a bloodline. He really should. Um, but you start out with a very large, very Hindu, um, relatively stable empire in terms of your culture and stuff. Um, you are going to have issues with some of these lands through here. They don't particularly like you because you haven't integrated their culture. So just be aware, you either want to integrate their culture or you need to start converting and stuff. Um, early on, you get a decision here at the start of the game. If you want to, there is an achievement, basically, as these guys, to convert all of India towards Buddhism. Um, I've already gotten this one. It's a little bit tricky. It's not overwhelmingly hard. Um, Ashoka's pir uh, pillars as the Maura conquer all of India, convert it to Buddhism, and have 80% religious unity. To help with that, you have a choice here. You can stay with Hinduism, which is a legitimately good religion, or you could flip to Buddhism. If you're going to flip, flip pretty quickly. Um, the longer you wait, the harder it will be to keep your land stable, and your land's already going to have issues with stability. Um, some parts of it over here are less loyal. This area over here tends to stay loyal. Um, so if you're going to embrace Buddhism, you want to flip to Buddhism, and then you'll have the ability to very cheaply swap your uh, deities to um, Buddhist ones rather than costing you this. It'll be uh, 15 stability. It'll be cheaper. Um, there are certain ones you want to take if you want to go for that achievement. I recommend... If you want to conquer tons of stuff, you stay Hindu, just because um, Hinduism is 80% of your population at the beginning of the game. But if you want the achievement, flip to Buddhism, and then we get into what innovations you should take. So if you're going to do Buddhism, you need to start on the religious tree, get over here to open religion, and then further down to prescribed canon. You start out with it eight innovations. It's worth using those eight innovations to try and get further down this tree. The only one I might say you could do otherwise is snag the plus two loyalty of characters under oratory. The rest of these you don't need at the beginning. You're militarily much stronger than anyone else around you. It's the stability that's the issue. You want the great temples if you're going Buddhist. Um, you want the conversion law and then further down you almost want to stay on the religious tree if you go Buddhist. Get witch banning witchcraft, formulaic worship, all four of those major ones put together will allow you to convert um, your land to Buddhism very quickly. Uh, you're going to have rebellions left and right. Uh, reduced governorship will help a bit, but it won't solve the full problem. Um, outside of that, the other one you want to work towards is gradual economic integration on the oratory trees, which unlocks the Grand Theater. Um, you want to do culture conversion if you can, but more importantly, both the Grand Theater and the Grand Temple um, give loyalty. Um, let me find the city here. They give loyalty to the province, basically. So if you put them in your um, a city, it basically adds plus 10 loyalty to that city, which doesn't fully solve the problems of loyalty, but it certainly will help. If you stay Hindu, you still basically want to do the same thing. It'll keep your lands loyal. If you go Buddhist, it's definitely required. Um, in terms of ideas, uh, probably martial ethos or ordered retreat, and then you want to snag sanction privileges and probably military administration, but it's your choice. Hospitium will also help you with how expanding. So you're going to have some internal issues. They're not huge. You're much more stable than, say, the Seleucids. Um, you start out with several tributaries. Um, you start out with a feudatory up here, I believe, as well. Um, and you start out with, th so, three tributaries and a feudatory. You can pretty easily expand as these guys without, a, without any war. 
Um, you just basically bribe people to either become your client state or pay you tribute. Be aware if you pay if you demand they pay you tribute and they fall into debt, they will automatically cancel the tribute, at which you will have a CB to conquer them. Um, getting the client status is easier because then you can just they'll stay loyal. You can integrate them at a later date. For tribal nations, you can freely grab them and toss them into a tribal va vassal status. And then when they have reformed out of a tribe, they'll become a client state. Tribal vassals, thankfully, do not take a relation slot. One of the bigger issues you might run across is having enough relation slots because you start with two. Um, if you swap out of, um, out of the appeasing stance, you start into neutral, you get another one. Um, you may want to consider snagging some additional slots through innovations. Thankfully, doing defending liberty here and local embassies on the way to gradual economic innovation will add two, which will help a lot. Uh, you can go further down and get more. Um, it's really kind of up to you. You shouldn't have too much issues with your subjects. Um, they'll stay loyal. Um, obviously, this is slightly different than other... Um, tech trees because surprisingly the Maura have a unique innovations um, which makes a lot of sense so uh, I'm not going to get into all of that but suffice to say they're there um, other things to consider snaggy a loyalty of generals when you're able to build a legion in your capital which you can do basically from the beginning if you want to flip over to it um, if you want to go Buddhist it may be worth consider flipping to get royal guard first because um, it's somewhat hard to get political power early on if you're trying to get subjects. And having a legion's nice. Thankfully, you don't need one because you have a massive amount of levies. Like, my gosh, this is a late-game army, and you start with it. You get 132,000 uh, troops to begin the game with. Um, it's very powerful. You'll want to use them for most of the wars. Legions won't really be overwhelmingly useful. Having one or two legions will help. Um... When you make your legion, you want to consider the fact that you get elephants. And if you use elephants, you're going to need more supply trains. But elephants are very powerful against everything, basically. They have almost no weaknesses. Um, archers, basically, and heavy cavalry, but that's about it. Um, but they do use a lot of supplies. Um, so any, any army you should have should have elephants in it, especially because you have the two unique Indian... Uh, military tradition trees one of which is the tribal one is basically obsessed with war elephants like seriously almost all of them have something to do with war elephants you've got five war elephant ones here um, you've also got some fort defense mercenary maintenance overall India has some very nice um, Indian tribes have some very nice traditions. On the Indian Kingdom one, I w I'm less impressed with it. it. Gives you more troops, gives you better stuff. It's pretty generic though. Um, nothing's overwhelming amazing. Basically, it wants you to use elephants, archers, and chariots backed up by heavy infantry. You have, I think, no light infantry bonuses at all. Um, it's quite frustrating. However, you can flip very quickly towards either the Persian or if you expand further and the Cilicids have converted stuff, you can get into the Greek tree. Um, but the Persian tree has some very nice bonuses on the right side here. Lots of stuff to make your lands more stable. You also get innovations and stuff as well. And overall, their traditions also double up on the elephants to some degree. Uh, it's very easy to do, especially once you get these guys as your subject. And then when you absorb them, integrate them, which you should integrate... Um, uh, you have to have 190 uh, relations, and you have to own the country for 10 years. Then you get all their land. Then you want to embrace their cultures or integrate their cultures, and then you can grab that tradition. Um, in terms of culture, though, uh, culture in India is a bit tricky, considering there's a lot of culture groups, and they all have a lot of population. The big ones I would recommend is this culture right here. Uh, it's probably worth giving them either right of intermarriage um, right of inheritance, just to make them more happy. They tend to be this group right here, which will revolt. The other one further down is these guys tend to be revolting. Um, but by and large, you only want to give it to the high population cultures. 
you start out amazingly with like four integrated cultures, which means your primary culture is less than happy, which means it might be worth grabbing an innovation or two to increase it. Um, but overall, it's not a, as big of an issue. So pass out a couple decisions, make these guys more loyal. If you're going Buddhist, you're definitely going to want to do that when you can afford to, because as Buddhist, everybody's going to hate you, even your um, integrated um, culture until you've converted them to Buddhism. Thankfully, Buddhism converts 30% uh, faster, which is quite exciting. And if you use um, uh, the Buddha here, um, oops, wrong page. Uh, if you use the Buddha here and you see what his omen is, his activated omen is citizenship happiness and five population converts to Buddhism. However, you do have a population of, you know, 4,000, 4, um, which will grow quite quickly. Uh, it helps. Um, obviously, the conversion law is what I said about grand temples will help even more. Uh, it's going to take you a good portion of the game to unite India. If you do it through conquest, you're going to be facing rebellion. Um, integration of, you can integrate a lot of them. Those that don't integrate, you can conquer them and rather than take the land, simply integrate them. The reason you may want to do that is you have the heritage of Chandragupta. Uh, or Ch yeah, I'm probably saying it wrong. You get population capacity and religious tech investment, but all aggressive expansion is 15% higher. This is crippling to a conquering empire um it makes it a lot harder to take land and stay stable um but as i said you can basically subject all the nations over here just through diplomacy so you go in you do um you check see if it's vaguely close if you're a couple thousand away or a hundred or two you don't want to do it but something like this 75 away is doable you improve relations that will get you some you give a gift, it'll get you another 25. You do an alliance, offer them military access. Um, you're gonna get pretty close. Um, just be aware of the diplomatic relations slot issue. Don't take too many subjects too early on. They take time to integrate, especially um, you're gonna want a lot of that political power early on to make changes and improve your nation. Thankfully, you don't have a military or an economic issue is these guys. Your biggest issue is stability early on. Thankfully, correcting that stability in India will then make it easier if you want to invade the Seleucids, but you can pretty happily just stay in India and still dominate the game. You have the highest starting score. Um, you also have one of the larger penalties right up there with Carthage and the other successors. Um, but no one's really gonna bother you over here. Fighting your way through here is an absolute nightmare. Uh, you want to build roads. You also want to build granaries on your frontline cities, um, wherever you've got them. Uh, increase the food capacity. Make trade routes, import food. Once you can break through the desert up here, um, like modern day Afghanistan and into central I Iran, um, you're going to have much easier wars. Uh, it is really tough to fight wars through here. So don't, un don't underestimate these guys early on and go to war to conquer them. They can resist you, and they can resist you pretty powerfully. Um, plus, you're going to have internal issues. But once you get out of Iran into modern-day Iraq in this area, uh, basically the whole world is yours. No one can really stop you. The only supply issues you're going to have are in the high deserts there. Um, another thing is Bactria up here. Oh, I'm probably saying it wrong. They are... You can sometimes subject transfer them away from the Seleucids if the Seleucids get weaker or they get rebellious. So be aware that you can sometimes flip them to you and then integrate them. It's excitingly fun to do. And everything else up here, you can basically send one legion up to kill. It's not hard. Um, it's really not fight worth fighting too many wars as these guys. It's much better to just simply um, basically client them and then integrate them later. You have an excessive amount of cities as the Indian nation here. So uh, you can get a very high level of research if you're willing to invest the money in it. Obviously, um, you do that with academies and um, courts of laws. Academies first, then courts of laws. Um, it'll also help keep your population more stable and happy. Um, I foresee multiple uprisings though. It's very hard not to have uprisings if you go Buddhist. If you stay Hindu, you're gonna have less issue, but it's still there. You'll also periodically get events where the Jainists and Buddhists will get more 
um, followers in your lands, at which point you'll automatically restart converting them, but it can be destabilizing at times. I have not found a good, easy way to convert to Jainism. I suppose you could probably do it. Um, you have to get a certain amount of uh, the religion in your lands before you can convert. And you don't start with it, so it's going to be a lot harder to do. Um, you're the unquestioned powerhouse of the East, though. No one's really going to mess with you. I've seen entire games with the Celicids and Bactrians totally ignore India for good reason. Um, they're very powerful. They have more internal issues. Internal issues is going to be your biggest threat and supply limits, basically. Trying to invade through desert lands is not particularly what one would call fun. So uh, that's them. They also have no forts, just to be aware. There's basically no forts in central India, so you're best off by putting forts on your borders if you're going to go to war with people. Because you're going to have issues there. You're also going to have quite a few barbarian uprisings and invasions. So convert those with civilization uh, governor uh, policies pretty much as soon as you can. That way you don't have to deal with constant barbarian invasions. Which don't really cause much damage but they're a pain. Uh, in the long run once you get stable and once you get the land converted. Then you can start going down military. You really don't ever have to go down the economic tree. Um, you're going to make a lot of money anyway, but you can. Obviously, the more wealthy you are, the more mercenaries you can afford, but you shouldn't ever need them as the Maura. So thank you guys all for watching for this. Hopefully you have enjoyed it. Uh, it's a pretty short guide on stuff I found playing with them and uh, strategies if you want to flip to Buddhism or stay Hindu. So... If you enjoyed this, do check out my other guides. Uh, do like it and subscribe if you haven't. Do check out my Discord and do check out all my other games. Uh, I've got multiple years of games going back. I've got different non-strategy ones as well if that's your stuff. If not, I've got a lot of EU4 and stuff as well. And I'll see you guys all in another video. Bye for now.